uh, I've been assigned the responsibility to moderate this session. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm R.K. Mittal, working, from, working for Rajendra Agriculture University, Bihar, India. This session is very important. Uh, uh, this intervention strategies for PHL mitigation. And I found that uh, there are two parallel sessions going on on the same thing. So I believe that many of the people are there in the other session also. But nevertheless, uh, you know that post-harvest losses are so important right from the cereal crops, uh, oil seed, pulses, uh, spices, condiments, ornamental plants, uh, horticultural crops, vegetables, uh, even the tree species and likewise. Uh, and a lot of work has already been done. So uh, you have been witnessing since yesterday a lot of efforts, uh, they, they go in uh, different aspects, right, from identification of the causes, then the factors affecting the post-harvest losses, and then how to manage those losses, including the cultural practices, the other treatments possible. One very important aspect is uh, that uh, these post-harvest losses are uh, even related with the pre-harvest conditions also. And I think in the days to come, when we have more discussions uh, on this aspect, we'll be able to identify many of such causes, uh, which will help us in better understand, understanding of the causes of post-harvest losses. Uh, I know there is a presentation downstairs. I just saw that uh, from the variety, and when we talk about the crop uh, of any cereals or any for that uh, purpose, the tuber crops, there was a presentation there. So from variety to variety, uh, the losses are different. And the single methodology, single intervention cannot work for all. So we will have to be very uh, I mean, analytical in our aspect, that uh, in our thinking, that uh, what are the causes, what we have to do it uh, to mitigate those situations. And even with, the, I mean, the conditions in Africa, they are not similar with those in Asia and then those with the, uh, the North or South America. So we will have to have a critical assessment. Uh, and I think for that, uh, in the days to come, uh, we will have to devise different aspect and then uh, identify the priority areas because this is such a big uh, theme that everything and uh, anything can be accommodated in that. Uh, so we will have to identify precisely that how we are going ahead uh, uh, in addressing those problems, uh, not staying too much. Uh, uh, between you and the distinguished uh, speakers uh, this morning. There are six speakers in this session and the time allotted is 95 minutes. Uh, so that makes it that uh, uh, each speaker will have uh, about 15 minutes time and I will request all the distinguished speakers to kindly adhere to the time limit so that uh, as the uh, organizers, they want me that uh, uh, it should be finished uh, within time. So not taking much time, we have six distinguished speakers and the first one is Mr. Ranjit Bandopadhyay. He is fairly well known. He works for International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, Nigeria. He has uh, research and development experience working for CGIAR in Asia, Africa, and Americas. Uh, he guides research and development activities uh, related to crop disease and mycotoxins at International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. And uh, uh, he has worked extensively on mycotoxins also. So this morning, he is going to talk about the aflatoxin biocontrol, scaling up a uh, pre-harvest management tool to reduce post-harvest losses in maize and ground. Dr. Ranjit Bandhupadhyay, you are most welcome to uh, for your uh, presentation.
Good morning. First of all, I would like to actually thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to talk about our work on aflatoxin. Um, this, is a this is a really great event in the sense that we are actually addressing a real problem that, that is taking place uh, in, in Asia, Africa, and all over the world. So what I'm going to talk about is on, on biocontrols, something that we have been working on since 2003 and how we are, uh, what the technology is and how we are scaling up. And this particular talk to work is a collaboration between IITA, USDA, ARS, and many, many national programs, and one of them is, uh, is in Senegal. So, First of all, aflatoxin 101. Uh, what is aflatoxin? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a toxin produced by the, the fungus Aspergillus flavus. This particular fungus resides in the soil and it, it stays in the crop, crop debris uh, and it multiplies in the soil and then it produces the toxin in the field and in the, uh, and in the stores. The fungus is actually carried from the field to the store. So that's the first thing to understand. Aflatoxin is not a post-harvest problem alone. It's actually a pre-harvest issue that goes into the post-harvest. Another part is the contamination is actually possible without us seeing the toxin, uh, without us seeing the, the fungus. And there are plenty of health effects, which I would not go into, and trade effects, because all of you are aware of it. Now, as I mentioned, aflatoxin is a pre-harvest problem, and this actually <laughs> demonstrates it. As this lady in Nigeria is taking out the corn on her head, and if you sample 241 samples and the aflatoxin levels more than 4 ppb, 10 ppb, and 20 ppb, by the time she actually takes it out, the crop is already 50, half the crop has more than 10 ppb, and that's the safe limit for Nigeria, for example. So half the crop is infected. So if we can actually get, stop the infection at that point, that can help in management. And subsequently, you actually see it increasing in the store after harvest. And so the amount actually increases in the harvest. Now, there are several practices that are followed for aflatoxin management and along the value chain, right from planting to consumption. And what I'm going to talk about is only one component of it. But it's a very strong component. In fact, as you will see later on, it can reduce the toxin contamination to a very large extent cons consistently. Now, Biocontrol, it actually works. And this is not a technology that, is, that was developed in Africa. This has origin in the US. In fact, the person who discovered it is uh, Peter Cote. And in the US, it's not a hundred th hundreds of thousands, it's actually a million acre treated with biocontrol every year on several crops. And here is a manufacturing plant that is in, in Arizona that produces the biocontrol agent. And there are two products that are actually approved by EPA, AF36 and Aflagard. So it's a technology that is actually used in the US to a large extent. It works in Africa too, and that's part of the presentation that I'm going to actually provide. Now, in terms of what is biocontrol, in fact, uh, you know, time is limited, so I might actually have to rush through some of these. But the major issue is this, that within this fungus, aspergillus flavors, it's not actually the same. You have a large amount of variation. There are some strains that produce a large amount of toxin, and there are other strains that, are, that do not produce toxin. And these non-toxin producing strains are already present in the, in the crop and in the environment. All that we do is to identify these strains and increase the frequency of these strains in the field and in the environment such that the infection that occurs on the crop is by the non-toxin producing strain. Uh, and another important principle to understand, and again, I can't show you the data, but there's plenty of data on this, is that the atoxinic strains are, can be applied without increasing the amount of fungus or without increasing the amount of infection in, 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 the, in the crop itself. Uh, the strains move from the field to the store, so the protection that you get from the field, it carries over into the store. It has got multiple year and multiple crop benefit. If you apply it in the maize field and if you grow peanut the next year, the peanut gets protected as well. And the key thing is that in every country that we work in, we always use native strains. We don't actually use strains from one country and take it to another country. 
there's always native strains that are used in each country. Again, I'll not go into the details of this, but usually in a country we start with about 5,000 strains collection. And those 5,000 strains are then screened, we have a selection process, and bring it down to about eight to 12 in the lab, and then these eight to 12 are then tested in the field to select the most adaptable and the most effective one, and four of those are identified and constituted into a product, and that becomes Aphasid. This product, we produce the spores of the product and mix the uh, spores along with a polymer and a color, coloring agent and coat it on sorghum seeds, dead sorghum seeds, and that becomes our formulated product, okay? Now, how does it work? So we have these packages of two and a half or five kg packages. All that the farmers have to do is two to three weeks before flowering, they just have to take it in their hand and throw it on the ground, just like spreading out fertilizer. And once they do it, in about, for about three to 20 days, the fungus which is coated on the sorghum grain, it begins to sporulate and spreads around in the entire environment. And then it replaces the, the entire environment, all the niches where aspergillus would grow, the non-toxin producing fungus is, will grow and then doesn't allow the toxin producing fungus to actually get onto the crop itself. Now, that's the basic principle. I'll just quickly show you two or three slides on the efficacy of the product. Uh, all our testing that we do are done in farmer's fields. We do not do any trials in research stations uh, or, in, or, in, or in the lab. So this is in Nigeria, four years. These are the number of fields and we got treated and controlled in four years. And the reduction that you see in terms of aflatoxin contamination ranges in between 82 and 94 percent. And this is at harvest time, and this is consistent. I'm showing you about four years data. There are actually six years data, I just can't fit it into the slide. The same effect continues into the store. So if you take these grains and put it in the store, it, as you see, the amount of contamination increases in the store but you still see a large amount of impact of reduction in the toxin contamination, okay? The same issue in, in, in groundnut. Now this is in Senegal now, uh, two different areas, Yorubel and Nero, harvest and storage, treated and control. Again, the level of reduction that you see in different tiers is more than 80%. So it's consistently uh, reducing the toxin contamination. Kenya. One of the hot spots of aflatoxin contamination. That's where people have died because of aflatoxin poisoning. These two are National Irrigation Board irrigation areas. They are high input areas. And this area is an area where actually people have died because of aflatoxin poisoning. These are number of fields here, treated and controlled, 93 to 99% reduction. Okay. This is the mean amount of aflatoxin. If you look at the number of fields that have more than 10 PBB, again, in an area where you had aflatoxin poisoning, people dying, all the grain is actually safer to eat there. So you can basically shift the entire, entire the, the toxin contamination to a, to a safer level. For example, here, there are these fields that had 3,700 3, PPB in the untreated one, but most of the treated ones were comparatively safe. Even this one, for example, although it was more than 10 PPB, it was in the range of 20, 30 PPB. And if you actually use the product the next year, gradually it's going to go down dramatically. So over a period of time, you can get rid of the problem. So far, so good. You have a technology, it works. And so to me, the easier part was that, developing the technology. But the more difficult part is to actually take it out. And there are several challenges in taking it out. First of all, aflatoxin is a hidden problem. You can't see it. Uh, you require chemical analysis. Awareness is low. There is actually a large amount of light time lag between exposure and, and, and cancer. Regulations in most countries are either non-existent or poorly enforced. 
The market, as a result, doesn't discriminate between toxin contaminate, contaminated and uncontaminated grains. There haven't been any work done on demonstration of the product value or the marketing part of it. And there's a lack of manufacturer. It's a product, it's an input that somebody has to manufacture. So with these challenges, we just have to find solutions. And we must translate this knowledge into something useful for, for the good of the people. And so the next part of the presentation is actually on that. How can we get this scaled up? First of all, you need a, you need a manufacturing facility to, to, to manufacture this. So we actually, with the Gates Foundation's support, we created a manufacturing plant in Nigeria. And uh, this can produce about five tons of Afrosafe per hour. And it, the capacity of this plant is to produce about, to treat about two million hectares every year. So if there's a market for two million hectares, this plant can actually do it. This one was a game changer because this was also uh, set up as a demonstration plant for, where people come and see how it is done and then take the technology back if they actually want it. We are currently developing two other smaller plants. One plant in Kenya, in, uh, in Kalro, Katumani. Um, we are building the plant from scratch, so the building, that's the building structure itself. In Senegal, a private company actually wants to manufacture, so they have set aside a building for that purpose. So this is where they, they are going to set up the plant in, 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 in Senegal. So that was the manufacturing part. Now, the product value, where can I actually sell this product? Who actually wants it? Because the market doesn't distinguish. So we looked for a segment of the market that already values aflatoxin safe material. And that segment of the market was poultry, poultry feed. Because the poultry producers, they know that if they have aflatoxin contaminated feed, chickens die. They can see it. And so what we did was the ex-president Obasanjo from Nigeria, he gave us an entire bay of 10,000 birds saying that, okay, show me that it works, that my profitability is gonna increase. So we ran this trial in his farm where we gave him Afrosafe feed, which means Afrosafe treated grains, maize grains, and then they had their own feed. The difference in mortality between these two was about 40%. There was slight improvement in the feed conversion ratio, and then when you translate the entire thing in, into, into cash, uh, the farm actually could gain $3,200 in terms of net profit from 10,000 birds over an eight week period. So that was the impact that the poultry industry could actually get. So we took this data into an innovation platform and calling the Poultry Association of Nigeria's president and the entire constituency, and they looked at the data and we called in the maize farmers also. And so they actually struck a deal saying that they're gonna buy all the Afrosif maize that they can get. So that's where the market was created. Another part of the, 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 uh, the puzzle is for any technology <coughs> to first go forward, if a commercial company actually takes it forward, they would first incentivize it. Uh, they will have different kinds of deals, <laughs> buy one, get one free or or whatever it is. So in this case, the G20 countries, they came together and they were looking for technologies that they could actually pilot in a new mechanism of funding called pull mechanism of funding. <coughs> in a pull mechanism of funding, what happens is the donors would give money to an agency once they demonstrate that technology has been used by, by, by people and for that use, then they are paid a prize money. And so the governments of Australia, uh, England, Canada, uh, there's one more country I'm forgetting, and, and the US and, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the five agencies, they, they put, set aside a kitty of $113 million. And so with that money, they are actually using this for incentivizing different technologies. And one of the technologies that they're incentivizing is Afrosafe. So basically what they do is they actually provide incentives for demonstrating adoption. And, and there's an entire whole gamut of things that they do, but the main thing is that if, you, if they can demonstrate that Afrosafe has been used, they actually pay $18.75 for every ton of Afrosafe treated maize. 
So this was used for, for actually demonstrating that this can be a profitable venture. What we then did was to actually have an integrated management approach for aflatoxin. And I was very uh, happy to see the approach that Rockefeller Foundation actually is promoting. Um, so we, we do have farmer groups and we have value chain and there are actually financing banks that are coming forward and financing what we call as aggregators or implementers. And then these implementers, they work with the farm, groups of farmers of 200 to 1500 and they provide inputs and trainings to improve productivity so the yield actually goes up. And then they provide training in pre and post harvest management. They use after safe and so they are, what they're doing is to actually get a large quantity of quality maize, okay, right. Um, and so after aggregation, they do aflatoxin testing and this market that has been created, they actually come together and that's where the, that's where the, 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 the maize is sold. So, I have a very quick lump then. The results of it, in the first year, there were nine implementers there were 3,271 farmers who used it, 5,000 hectares of land were treated, and the production was 13.3 million hectares, 13.3 uh, million tons. 54% uh, was actually aggregated. 97% of the grain had less than 20 parts per billion. Um, and those implementers got an award of $109,000. But the main thing is, in the market, this grain actually got a premium of 17%. And to me, the, the icing on the cake was the farmers actually kept the grain from their home consumption and improved their family health. Uh, right now, we are actually working in 11 countries, and we are at different stages of, of development. We, the colors have changed. So we have a registered product in Nigeria and in, uh, and in Kenya, and there are other stages that, that has actually happened. Uh, right now in scaling up, 26,000 up to 260,000 tons of maize is going to be grown uh, in Nigeria by year three, which is 2017. In Senegal, uh, they are used 16,000, 16 tons in the last two years, 20 tons are going to be used next year. In Kenya, the government actually allocated $13 million for this, this program. And they bought 220 tons, 230 tons of grain that is currently being used in, 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 in Kenya. So in summary, aflatoxin in food and feed is actually um, pervasive in Africa. Uh, contamination starts in the feed, sorry. Uh, the biocontrol and, and other practices can be actually used to improve the quality of the crop. And these pilots need to be scaled up for, 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 for greater impact. This work is actually done by two teams, one team in Arizona and another team in Africa. Uh, and so we have a, a great amount of collaboration between the USDA team and the, and the Africa team. And these are our, our donors who actually support this work. Thanks. I'm sorry it took a long, longer time. <laughs>